I, I am so, 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 so sorry. We're having a few technical issues right now at the moment. Um, this session should be working right now. And unfortunately, we've lost people. But um, oh, it's going back up again. The numbers are going back up again. Um, we've got a great presentation for you today from, from Damien. Um, if we can if, if we can get this working, I think it is now working. Um, I'm so, 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 so sorry for everybody. Um, and I'm really, really pleased and grateful that everybody's kind of hung on. So um, more than grateful for that. Um, the sun's disappeared outside and maybe that was an omen. So uh, maybe we should have known. Um, but anyway, um, I suppose I'll start. I'll, I'll start. Um, so basically, this is uh, welcome everybody to our, I think it's the fourth webinar in our series, in our summer series now. Um, they're going swimmingly. We had kind of about 500 people, 496 people sign up for this webinar. So it's been incredibly popular. Um, and they're only kind of growing from strength to strength, which is really good. Um, as always, it's going to be recorded. So if you do want to watch it back um, again afterwards or share it, if you think it's particularly good, which of course it will be, um, then go and look on the new section of our website and they're all kind of uploaded on there and you can see um, Hughes, and uh, Ian and Graham's from last week, all up on the new section of the website. So go and have a look at that. Um, there's a chat function on uh, the right hand side of your screen, which I am incredible. I don't think I've ever been so grateful to see a chat function filling up with people saying hello. So um, thank you very much indeed to saying hello. I am really glad that you're all here after that little slight technical issue. So thank you. Um, pop your questions in there if you have any kind of as we're going through. Um, Got loads of people. This is amazing. Jordan, Singapore, Putney. Yep, very, very glamorous. Uh, Canada, all sorts of different places. Netherlands. So um, great. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, oh, and Mexico. And so I'll hand you over now. Damien will take questions at the end. Um, and so Damien is our facades director. He's been with us for the last eight years um, and he joined to head up our facades department. Um, he has grown it from strength to strength, so I will let him introduce his talk on facade for um, facade design for net zero buildings. Thanks very much, Damien. I'll turn my camera off now, put the presentation on, presentation. and let you go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, it's it's great to be able to to talk to so many people and to um, and to share our thoughts on uh, what this interesting topic. Um, so, as Kat said, uh, so fourth uh, in these series of, of webinars, and um, the last couple have uh, focused on our structural glass design and uh, structural envelope design. So you've heard from James uh, introducing some of our pioneering work there, and, and Ian and Graham going into uh, more detail on specific projects of structural envelopes. In the next few weeks, then you're going to hear from my structural colleagues um, looking at low energy uh, structural design, uh, some of the tools we use in structural optimization and good work in timber uh, engineering and, um, and embodied carbon, low embodied carbon structures. Um, my colleague Hugh talked the other week about our specialist generalist approach in, in facades. That's a bit of a mantra that we, we use in facade design because it's a it's such a complex, wide-ranging um, subject that we need to be you know, familiar with uh, many different um, facets of engineering. And one of those really important facets is uh, environmental design, env environmental performance, energy performance of facades. And that's really the focus of, of the topic today. So our, our work in environmental design and energy performance has been uh, really focused on the facade in particular and and we have a team of building physics experts in the in our team who are uh looking at various ways that the facade interacts with the external environment so that's a reflected glare um glass thermal shock assessments um the temperature build up in double skin facades comfort around facades um but you know really focus on on uh, what's happening in the facade itself we, we've started to look more widely at um, the impact of facades on buildings, um, looking at daylight assessments, that's for, for well criteria or BRIAM or, or lead assessments. Um, and, uh, but frequently we look at sort of the, the broader aspects of uh, environmental performance and as I say, very specifically to the facade. 
So what we're able to do through our modeling is, is look at um, various options um, for uh, facade buildup, glass, um, glass buildup, shading systems um, in, in a level of detail and sort of granularity that a building uh, mechanical engineer, MEP engineer, isn't really focused on. So that's where, that's where, we, that's where we look in detail. And we're frequently asked and frequently asking ourselves, how can we make the facade perform as well as possible to allow low energy buildings. Now, really low energy buildings is, is, uh, needs us to look at not just the facade, so it's, it's a much broader picture. But, um, but you know, we, we want to know how a facade can contribute and do as best as it can to allow us to, to realize low energy buildings. And so that's really what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, and in particular, this concept of net zero buildings. Um, you know, what is it? Where does it? Where does that come from? Why are we all talking about that now? Um, and uh, how a facade can help us to to get a, a net zero building. And uh, and some of the tools that we use uh, to do that to measure our buildings, and some of the challenges that we're going to face in in getting to uh, net zero targets in the future. So. Um, I mean, just stepping back, we, we all know, we're all very familiar with, um, with the, 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 the fact, the overwhelming um, scientific evidence that, uh, of human impact on, on the climate. And, you know, that's become uh, very real um, in, uh, in recent years, in particular 2019 was, was pretty devastating um, for, for realizing these impacts. And, um, and there's, there's been a real wake up call. Um, the UK government, uh, has actually shown a bit of leadership in this and was, I think, the first major economy to sign up to becoming uh, net zero, to be carbon neutral by 2050. Now, well, the way they did that was to take uh, our 2008 Climate Change Act, which was already there, which was aiming for an 80% reduction, and they amended it last year to say that they're going to go for a 100% reduction. Now, we talk about net zero because there's uh, allowing that there will still be some emissions from aviation and things that there's to technology is really not going to be there by 2050 to have for those areas to be carbon neutral so there'll have to be some offsets in other areas like uh, carbon capture and storage or reforestation that will suck up um, carbon from the atmosphere to allow some remaining pollution so that's where we talk about net zero now the UK is a net zero target. Um, a lot of other countries aren't quite there yet. The US notice, no, notably is, um, is not making any commitment, but, um, but states within the US are. So California is supposed to be carbon neutral, um, New York has, and we see cities uh, as well who are taking leadership in this and, and saying that they're gonna set their own carbon targets and uh, to be carbon neutral. Some of them even before 2050, so Copenhagen set by 2025, there's a list of a few cities there that are um, that are yeah, aiming for you know good good targets. Uh, some of them before 2050. Now, I think what's important about this is that when you talk about cities being carbon neutral, really then the focus is on buildings. And the reason for this is that if you look at an, a national picture, buildings make up maybe about a third of the um, of the uh, energy use um, across all sectors. Now, when you look at cities, however, you take out industry because there's not much of that in cities. You take out um, aviation and shipping and things that are uh, that are counted in national targets, and make, buildings make up the vast majority of the carbon emissions in um, in, in cities, seventy to eighty percent. Now, um, so that puts the focus on buildings, and it's down to us as designers and architects um, to uh, and engineers to to answer that. And again, 2019 was a real you know uh, watershed year for uh, awareness of this and you know a lot of us were took part in protests and and um and demonstrations because i think this is something that is we are really feeling as human beings is something that we need to do um we need to address it's within our powers as, as designers to 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 impact um building design and um and on the the bottom left you can see the um world green building council has been pushing their advancing net zero campaign and what their position is that, you know, for all buildings to be net zero by 2050, then that means that new buildings need to be net zero by 2030. That's because we'll probably need 20 years at least to sort out existing buildings, which are actually probably a much harder problem. That gives us 10 years to figure out how we're gonna go from our current building practice to, uh, to net zero buildings. Now, 
Um, now we're left answering, you know, okay, we know what the goal is, but what does it mean specifically? And we're looking for a, a framework definition. And, you know, UK Green Building Council has set up a, a framework definition. This was released in um, 2019 for how, how we should be talking about uh, a net zero building. Um, and they separate it into construction, which is talking about embodied carbon, which really means the, the stuff that goes into making a building, and then operational energy, which is about the cooling, heating, lighting, all of the systems that, that keep the building running. And that's really what we're talking about today. Um, and, and really is the current focus of the industry because embodied carbon is just a little bit behind in our understanding. So, uh, it, it, it kind of it could be a little bit confusing, but I just wanted to to make clear that um, when we're talking about net zero buildings, we shouldn't confuse that with a kind of similar concept, which is a, a nearly zero energy building. This is a kind of unhelpfully similar um, uh, name, but nearly zero energy buildings is is a concept that is actually already in law in in EU and, and UK law and. Um, buildings all public buildings had to be nearly zero energy buildings from last year and all buildings all public and private buildings from next year will have to be nearly zero energy now the uh, the problem with this definition is that um countries member states of the eu were allowed to come up with their own definition for what a, a nearly zero energy would be and some countries denmark um, is, is one took a very ambitious approach um i think estonia was one that also took a pretty good approach UK government said, actually, we're just going to say that meeting current building regulations, we'll call that near, nearly zero energy. Um, and given that the uh, building regulations as relates to energy were last really updated six years ago, this is a bit of a step back. So we should ignore that concept and really we're still left looking for, um, for, a, uh, for a meaningful definition of, of net zero energy or, uh, buildings. So to that, I think we the, the best definition that we know about um, that, that I know is the LETI, and LETI is the London um, Energy Transformation Initiative. It's a, a really great organisation that's kind of come to prominence in the last year or so, uh, and has been you know leading the way in in talking about um, the net zero buildings, about um, embodied carbon, and and various other issues, which I encourage you to, to check them out. Um, but they've produced this um, this leaflet last year, um, describing or earlier this year, describing what uh, the characteristics of a, a, a net zero building um, should be. And the the message is clear: it, it's we need to reduce demand, uh, we need to get rid of fossil fuel um, from as an energy source for a fuel source for our buildings. Um, where we're using um, Electricity, it needs to come from a renewable source and through a contract that's placed with a renewable energy supplier. Uh, and and they're, they're suggesting we should not be able to use um, carbon offsetting. So uh, some, some definitions of, of net zero allow for offsetting, so you can just pay you know, through a carbon tax or, or something, you can pay for any remaining um, emissions. They're saying that that should not be um, part of the definition of a net zero building which means that you know we've got a lot of ground to make up now what, what does all this mean for for the facade um and i think again to answer that it's it's important that we look at um really the source of um of of energy use and, and of fossil fuel use in the building so um and and the answer is going to be slightly different for different buildings uh, this is again this is uk numbers but uh heating for homes is about half of the energy that we use, half of the um, of, of of carbon rather that that, is, that we generate, and um, and so heating for homes is is really the priority. When it comes to other buildings, um, looking at commercial buildings, public buildings, it's a bit of a mixed picture because um, heating is really only one component, but it, uh, but cooling, um, lighting, other systems be become a heavier part of the mix. So it's not quite so straightforward. And I'll take those two two things in, in turn. Um, and again, just looking at, at, at buildings, I think that in the in the 30 years that since we in the UK at least reached um, our peak emissions, we've been steadily making improvements across uh, most areas. Buildings has been pretty slow. Um, buildings, we haven't really seen a, a, a substantial Im improvement in emissions over the last 30 years. But what we have seen really substantial improvement is in the power generation. 
And the reason for that is that uh, we've really embraced um, uh, renewable energy and have started to move away from fossil fuels in quite a big way. It's been really impressive that over the last 10 years that um, fossil, fossil fuel um, use has declined. While renewable have gone from being, um, you know, a fairly small part of the market share to now actually we have more capacity in renewables than we do in fossil fuels, and that number is continuing to rise each year. So, whereas building have you know made a relatively small change in in the last few years, power has made a a, a big change. And the question, if I can go to the next slide, she's stuck. Kat, can you help? Going through the slides randomly. Well, that's helpful, isn't it? <laughs> oh, here we are. Are we, are we going back? Sorry, I've, I've taken control, but are you... Uh... It is a day for technical uh, technical issues today. There's clearly a gremlin somewhere. Sorry, Damien. There you go. Where am I? Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, okay. So what the message was that for us to really improve buildings, we've got to take advantage of improvements that have been made in, in the in power. And basically, that means that we need to change the way that we that we get fuel for our buildings. And so, um, and so we need to move from a fossil fuel based heat network, because we're focusing on homes. To, uh, to a renewable-based heat network. And that means air source heat pumps, it means district heating, it means ground source heat pumps, but moving away from your um, from, from boilers. Now, the, the crucial thing about this and about um, uh, the fact that we have pretty poorly insulated homes is that uh, we have very big spikes. We have got from, from morning to evening, um, we've got a big change in, in, our, in the demand. And we go from winter to summer, we've got very big spikes so you can see both on a, a, a on a daytime basis and an annual basis, we've got these huge spikes um, in in demand, and but our capacity is pretty limited, so and and pretty constant. And so, kind of using phrase that you'll all be very familiar with, what we need to do is flatten the curve, basically, of our demand, and to to reduce the demand to a level that that we that we've got capacity to deal with. So, so very familiar concepts to all of you. Um, and the uh, and really what that means is about uh, improving insulation. Um, so we improve insulation, uh, we get rid of the, the the spikes, and and we keep we we keep demand to a level that we can actually provide electricity for. And um, and that's why it's kind of it's uh, it's very clear that for us to get better building performance um, in in homes, really the focus is on. Is on thermal performance and U values. <clears throat> so, um, so it means that we're going to need to go from uh, buildings that are kind of uh, double glazed, where our standard at the moment is probably double glazed, pretty good wall U value insulation. Um, the unfortunately, at the moment, thermal bridging is something that is really overlooked, um, is is kind of fudged, but you know, but isn't looked at in detail. And we're not really taking air tightness very seriously. And I think that in, in future, what we need to do is to, you know, triple glazing needs to be standard. Wall U values probably don't really need to improve that much. Um, because if you look at the the, the, the charts on the on the right hand side, you know, wall U value is, is, you know, we beat ourselves up about it, making the wall stick, but actually it's a pretty minor com component of the of the total heat loss. Um, thermal bridging is something that people just tweak the numbers without looking at it in detail and or somehow make their energy models look a lot better than they really are. Um, and I think that is something that we very much need to address. So thermal bridging, and I've written about this and, and lectured about this before, you know, it's get, really get being my bonnet about this, that um, is completely ignored by the thermal models and um, that, that we produce. And no one's checking it either from the design side or, or the construction side. No one's really taking responsibility for uh, looking after thermal bridging. Now, we, we are, and I'm sure a lot of other facade consultants do that when they're involved in projects, but the vast majority of buildings that are done out there, particularly homes, that you don't have a facade consultant. You don't really have anyone looking at this, and it's just it's something that falls between cracks. 
in the design team and, and, and we as an industry need to get better at this. Air tightness, it's the same. And this is a um, histogram of, of, uh, of different air tightnesses and, and targets people set in what they actually achieve. And, uh, and this is really great research. I mean, my, my takeaway from this is whatever you target, you're probably going to get it. So why don't we just choose better targets and, and just you know, work a bit harder to, to get those, uh, to reach those targets by, by having better workmanship on site. At the moment, everyone just uses a, a number that they feel safe with, and which is probably the building, you know, the last building that they finished. Uh, and they say, let's get that, but they don't push themselves to, 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 uh, for, for better targets, more ambitious targets. And that's what we need to do. <clears throat> so, um, so in summary, when it comes to homes, it's a fabric first approach. Um, to, to reduce demand, basically. So triple glazing, better wall for U values, thermal bridging air tightness, um, and, and working together to make sure that we're really getting it right. And I think some more research needs to be done in uh, making air tightness a bit more scientific, not just picking your favorite number. Um, uh, thermal bridging, we need to get much more uh, you know, detailed look at this and really taking responsibility for it. And I think really those areas where we need to see product development, because um, the, the products that we use to deal with thermal bridging aren't, aren't there in all cases. And um, over between now and 2030, when, when these you know, targets need to be met in practice, there really needs to be some, some product development. Um, now, moving on to commercial buildings, there's, um, it's, a, it's a different set of challenges. And um, you know, my, this is famously quoted, um, uh, Mayor of New York, former uh, presidential candidate Bill de Blasio, uh, who said you can read that they were going to introduce um, legislation to ban glass and steel skyscrapers that have contributed so much to global warming. So he's he's pinning global warming largely on facade design. Which you know is that fair? Or is it not fair? And I think that's you know, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, now the the facade's contribution to a building performance um, is going to vary a lot. It's going to vary depending on your um, the climate, um, many building factors, and this is maybe two um, two examples of, of projects we've been involved in in London and New York, and and you can see that um, the the makeup of the of the energy demand is very different for those buildings. The the facade certainly has a um, a, a role to play. And, um, and I've highlighted the, the, the three key aspects really for us to consider, which is um, heating, cooling and ventilation and, and lighting. And, um, and the, the, clearly those are gonna depend on, on the climate that you're in, um, whether it's a, you know, a heating based climate like London or a cooling based climate like most of the US or, or uh, other countries. But beyond the climate, the other thing that is, is is very important when looking at the, um, the facade's contribution is is really the ratio of the facade to the to the building floor area. So looking at the, the plan form, if you have a relatively narrow um, distance from from the facade to the core, if you go in a, in a central core building, then that facade is going to play a much bigger role in the building form. It's compared to a very deep plan floor plate, maybe with the the cores at the edge. Where you might be, you know, 20, 30 meters away from the facade, and in that case, the, the, you know, the, the whatever happens, whatever heat transfer happens through the facade, is going to have much less impact on what goes on in the middle of the building. So it's always going to be specific. And um, you know, the, something that we always come up against the, is, is this debate is um, is uh, looking at the the balance of of solar gain and daylight, and you know, very clearly on a, on a glass facade. There's, um, there's a consideration and there's a trade-off between um, dark glass, which is going to block the daylight, but maybe um, uh, you know, control the solar gain, but is then going to leave you with the problem of having to turn the lights on more uh, and having a higher lighting gain to um, to com conduct the, combat the fact that you don't have enough useful daylight coming into the building. And so, you know, so dark glass, dark reflective glass or, or tinted glass could be useful at blocking solar gain, but it's not very good at, um, at giving you, you good daylight. So this is something that we look at frequently on our um, on projects, is getting this balance right of, um, of, of useful daylight uh, and solar gain. 
and uh, controlling solar again. And you know, there's various uh, technologies out there that, that we use. Um, shading systems can be very effective, and we do we spend a lot of our, our time and energy um, looking at what's the most effective shading system that will that will deal with, will get that balance right. Uh, something that we found very effective on a few projects is, a, is double skin facades and, and closed cavity facades. And this is a project in, in California. We had a very deep floor plate. Um, we needed uh, to get daylight you know, deep into the floor plate, but then the people who were going to be near the facade, be close to the facade, were going to suffer from, from discomfort, from overheating. And what we found is that um, a a facade system that has a dynamic performance that you can change the the amount of of light and heat that you let in uh, throughout the day throughout the year by by changing the the angle of these blinds um is was a very very effective way at, at getting that uh, solar gain versus daylight balance correct one of the things we didn't anticipate with this building is that um it, it would also have an effect on the on the heating because this being uh, in california there's relatively few times of the year when you when you need to have the, the heating on during the building, but there, but we still did need to have uh, an active heating system in the building because the people who were near the facade, um, if it was a fully glazed facade, were going to have periods in the in the morning, uh, winter months when they were just dis feeling discomfort from um, from downdraft and uh, and radiative effects of the cold glass, and what we found actually is that a, a closed cavity facade with that better U value that it gives, um, was helping to control the, the comfort next to the facade. So, so we, you know, had a marked um, improvement on the, uh, both the, the <clears throat> radiant comfort from the glass down drafts, and it was giving us a kind of win-win-win of solar gain, daylight and heat. So yeah, this was, this was a really great example for us. Um, Final project I want to talk about is um, is a competition that we won uh, along with Wilkinson Air, um, Gartner, uh, Level Infrastructure, and MRG uh, landscape designers earlier this year. This was an ideas competition, um, not to be not to be realised, but it was a, an interesting exercise for us because the whole concept of this was to take a 1960s building, to replace the facade, and to uh, and to show how improving the facade would improve the building performance and, and take it towards a 40% a reduction in, in CO2, which was the target. So this really is the, is, you know, the, the, the perfect example for us to look at if everything else being equal, how can you change a facade and change a building performance? So, um, so you know, as with any building, it has its um, you know, specifics of its site it, um, it's you know very it's in midtown Manhattan it's got a lot of taller buildings next to it uh, relatively narrow streets and um, and you know it was pretty well shaded by by surrounding buildings the uh, you, you, what we found is actually most of the facade apart from the the upper levels were actually well shaded by adjacent buildings and um, and didn't uh, didn't suffer too much from from uh, overheating um, and actually did suffer from not having enough daylight. So the questions were, you know, how can we uh, improve the facade that, that has these specific parameters? We, we knew that, um, that heating uh, was gonna be uh, pretty key for this. Um, and that was because of the, the heating systems that the building has, it was a steam heat system. Uh, so, so, you know, it was, it was very much fossil fuel based, and um, and and we knew that to reduce carbon, we need to reduce fossil fuels, which means reducing heating. Um, and and this building also was running the cooling system off of the seam, so really the yeah, heating and cooling what we were trying to to deal with most. Um, lighting was sort of secondary in in this. So so we knew that uh, U value needs to be better. So we we straight away said we need to go triple glazing. We also felt that floor to ceiling glass is not really appropriate because you know oftentimes we put in floor to ceiling glass, but then you know you, you don't need all of that um, that glazing, certainly not up to uh, below desk height. So we put in a, a solid spandrel up to desk height. We we left some areas that had um, uh, floor to ceiling glass so you could get that glimpse out 
at full level, but we did introduce some opacity. And we also looked to, to introduce some, some shading um, at the right place within the building. The, um, we then took that, uh, that exposure of the facade and we looked at you know, how, how do we optimize this, this shading system that we're going to put on. <clears throat> now, there's, there's, again, there's a careful balance because the, the, the heat gain that you get in the winter months is actually useful heat. Um, it's, it stops you needing to, to burn the fossil fuel heat. So, so we wanted heat uh, through the facade in the, in the winter, but you want to prevent it in the, in the summer and you've got too much heat. So we had to be very careful uh, designing these shading systems so that we're, we're getting the right balance. And so what you see on the, on the right hand side is some studies that we did, sensitivity studies to say, well, what's the, what's the best uh, depth of this fin, horizontal fin, that's going to uh, get the get the get us on the right side of uh, of allowing useful heat in, but not allowing too much heat in. And we settled on um, it was five sorry some feet. Um, it's a, a, a five foot projection, and we and we looked at where that needs to be placed around the building. Oops, um, to 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 be optimal. And going through this of improving the U values, introducing these shades, we we proved that we were able to. Um, to reduce the, the heating demand in the building by 60%. Pretty substantial benefit on, on, on the heat. On the cooling side, however, it wasn't so good. Sorry. Um, it, was, it was only about 20% uh, benefit on the cooling. And, and the reason for that, again, goes back to this being a very deep floor plate. So we had, we had side cores, um, very deep floor, and the, the heat that uh, the, is building up in there that needs to be uh, to be cooled down is really from people. It's from uh, it's from computers. It's from the use of the building. It's not so much heat that's coming in from um, from the facade. And so you know we could uh, so the facade was giving us a, a really great benefit in um, in reducing heating demand, not so much on the cooling demand. But nevertheless, between those two components on their own, um, the improving the facade was getting a 20% reduction in the total energy use of the building without doing anything else to, <clears throat> to lighting, to MEP, to anything. Um, we did get some benefit uh, from, from improved daylight from using clearer glass. And so once you did uh, in, change the lighting system, that got us to maybe a further 12%. Um, so what we, we, we looked at embodied energy in this as well um, for replacing the facade because that's an important consideration um, and found that the, the, the investment that you made in, in carbon through making these facade improvements would actually pay back in, in only four years. So you then, you then, for the life of the facade after that, you've got sort of 36 years of, of benefit for your four years of investment. So definitely, you know, made a lot of sense to to make the investment and, and it paid for itself. When when you when you look at then the, the facade and, and sort of summarizing how far we've got with this, the, the facade goes about 20% of the way. You make improvements in the lighting. Uh, that was that was helping. It's still not getting us to um, to to even a 50% reduction. And to 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 really get to 50% reduction, we did have to rely on the decarbonization of the uh, New York heating grid, which is which is happening through increased renewables. So by we by 2030 we were able to get about a a 40 percent reduction, and and to get to net zero, there's still 60 percent to be made up, and and the that is really going to have to be done by full scale replacement of the heating and cooling systems, which you know which naturally would happen. In a, in a building over the kind of life cycle we're talking about. So you replace those, you replace those with, um, with electrical systems, then you rely on the New York energy grid to get into 100% renewables, which it will do it you know, down the line in the future. And that was really the, the way you get to net zero building. So, you know, as much as we want the facade, we're, I'd like to be able to say that the facade is the answer to all of this. It's not, I mean, the facade goes 20% of the way, the lighting gets you another you know, 10% of the way, and beyond that, it really comes down to the systems that you're using and uh, and making those as, as as carbon efficient as possible, 
and um, and and then the rest of the work's got to be done by grid and infrastructure that's out of control of the building. So a really useful lesson for us for how far the facade can can push the building performance. Um, so really, uh, you know, just, that's just summarizing where we are. Um, the you know heating clearly a priority for for housing offices. It's a bit of a mixed picture, and we need to be you know have a specific tailored approach to each building that looks at things in the round, the heating, cooling, lighting, and you know, and the facades are an important part of the equation, but they're not the whole thing. Um, and you know, and that's why it puts it on us to work, you know, collaboratively to do the right facade for the building. Uh, and and you know, and that's going to be a different picture for 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 every building. So um, you know, maybe finally just talking about some of the some of the uh, the, the challenges that lie ahead. Now, um, policy, I think there's a real danger in policy keeping up. Um, the, for example, when you look at um, the, the UK situation, everything I've said about uh, moving to an electrical based heating system, I think that most people who, who know about these things would, would agree with that. The, the problem is that policy doesn't actually tell you to do that. Policy is locking in uh, the, the fact that 10 years ago, we had a very high, highly polluting electrical system and, and gas was actually better from a carbon point of view uh, by a factor of uh, three or four. Now, it's, uh, now electrical is cleaner than gas, but to get compliance, we still need to, to use these very old um, energy models and prove compliance with very old energy models because government policy isn't keeping up with the, the facts of the, the improved um, performance of the grid. So there's a danger that we get, you know, we're designing for compliance with a model that isn't really capturing reality. And, um, and so government policy and all of the models that we use need to really be kept up to date and kept, you know, with the, the, what's a rapidly changing picture. So, yeah, and that's, that's a real challenge for us all. As I've said, I think you know collaboration within design teams, both to get the the, the right balance for each building, um, but also to answer these things like uh, like thermal bridging, which just isn't being picked up and and needs to be. Um, I haven't really talked much about uh, the the other aspect of the performance gap, which is the fact that we're we're modeling buildings and we're not actually checking if if they're performing. And you know, there's a we can get to. A, Big boring discussion about sort of data protection and whatever else, but you know, the fact is that the, our clients um, and and we uh, all need to be as open as possible about how our buildings are actually performing, because you know it's no good us tr just trying to meet compliance models and you know boasting about what a model is when it has no bearing on on reality. Um, and the kind of final point uh, about the, the challenges, I think, is you know there are new new products that will need to be developed. I think new systems that will need to be developed in, in facades. And I, I, I didn't really talk about it, but earlier I had a point about you know, prefabrication. And I think that our kind of very site-based way of, of doing particularly residential construction is something we need to take a very close look at because you know, that's not delivering uh, good air tightness. It's not delivering good performance in, in thermal bridging. And you know, the more we take that off-site, the more we, we improve quality then I think we'll improve the quality of the of the built construction. Um, and further challenges that lay ahead, you know, I haven't really talked, I've talked a bit about existing buildings, but um, you know, that's a that's a, a another big picture um, and a big question that is gonna is gonna hit us in a few years time. So, you know, we to to um, to really be able to grapple with that properly, you know, that's the importance of, of us looking at new buildings and getting the design of new buildings as good as possible, yeah, as as fast as possible, um, and the body carbon that will come in uh, from my colleagues uh, Toby looking at structure, and um, and my colleague Simon is going to be talking in a couple of weeks about the whole life cycle of um, of facades and uh, end of life and and the body carbon of facades. So um, tune in for that in I think two or three weeks time. Um, and so my, my final point is, you know, energy is as important as this is, as important as net zero is, we can't look at this as 
as the the only thing right and we we can sometimes overlook some of these issues when we look we focus too much on on uh on say thermal performance you know if if improving thermal performance means making your window smaller then you then you you got to think about you know is this a, a good building right and you know, a, a good building has has a good performance but it's also looking after comfort um the the indoor air quality which is something that you know we're in real danger of uh, of just creating another problem that we're going to have to solve in another 20 years if we make our buildings all super airtight uh and super reliant on mechanical systems that we can't open windows uh we can't get good you know we can't get um, good air quality good fresh air in our buildings and make them desirable buildings because so we're all spending a lot more time indoors at the moment and I think being very aware of, uh, of what makes a good building that we're going to spend a lot of time. In. So can't think, yeah, uh, can't forget about all of those things when we're focusing on 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 getting the right U value. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for listening. I hope that was informative, and you've had some uh, some some useful takeaways from that. And happy to take any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. That was really good. Um, I've kind of frantically been trying to kind of reply to some emails from the technical issues earlier, but um, I can see the questions now are kind of racking up on the right hand side, which is great. Um, I think that kind of um, there's been a few kind of questions about end of life um, facades for the end of life and kind of talking about embodied carbon. So uh, there's been one from Anil saying, is triple glazing worth the embodied, the extra embodied carbon? Um, and then also, if you can kind of tie that in, I think, to um, was one down here um, asking about how important do you think it is to design facades for the disassembly at the end of life um, to facilitate reuse, recycling elements, um, recycling of elements? Are there any barriers stopping this from being implemented? And I think this is a big issue that we were talking about the other day, I think. So um, over, over to you on that one. Um. Oh, okay. I'll I'll take the the question about um, uh, triple glaze. Is it worth the investment? Uh, in the studies that we've done, yes. Uh, and I I I take the point that it's not going to be the case um, in, for every building. Um, but and I think there's a quite a useful um, sort of counterpoint to what some of what I've said is that embodied carbon. You're making it now. Um, and you're using the, the, the you know, kind of uh, often the quite um, energy intensive methods now, whereas arguably you could, you know, you, you can wait and deal with the poor performance and, and, and accept the, the cleaning of the grid and, and et cetera um, to, to make up for that poor performance in, in the future. In, in the studies that we've done, however, it doesn't really stack up, and um, and because it is such a remarkable improvement by in residential in particular, uh, going from double to triple glazing, in, in the studies that we've done, it it really is worth it. So, um, but you know, as I say, it'll be it'll be you know encourage you to do your own studies. Um, I think we should be sharing uh, more knowledge about this, and um, and yeah, I'd welcome a welcome a debate. Um, what was the other one about? Uh, the other one was about how you, you know, how do you design for kind of disassembly at the end of life? Um, you know, can you do it to be able to reuse or recycle kind of different parts which have life expired, other than kind of other parts which haven't? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and um, that's something that we're uh, also putting a lot of um, thought into, and I think you'll hear from my colleague Simon on that in in a couple of weeks. So I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to sort of step on his toes, um, but uh, yeah, design for disassembly is is super important, and the uh, a lot of the materials that we use in in facades are pretty energy intensive. Um, aluminium is is very energy intensive. Uh, glass has uh, relatively high embodied um, carbon content, um, but is is very very um, easy to recycle. Uh, now, as as in glass itself is very easy to recycle. I mean, the problem is that we we put it into insulated units. Um, we you know we put frit on it 
we, 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 we manufacture into products that make it difficult to recycle. And so, um, so being able to peel those things apart um, and, and sort them and send them off to places they can be reused uh, is very important. The, the, one of the concepts that we were looking into for that Madison Avenue project is a, is, is a system where you can, um, where you can replace glass we can replace um, the, the, the failed bits of glass or maybe the oxidized uh, coating, um, the pane of that glass, uh, potentially on site. So the, the glass is the, the, the raw glass with the laminated glass has a much longer life expectancy from, from, um, from the coated glass could remain in place, replace the coated glass, uh, keep the aluminium in place because um, the aluminium systems might have this, you know, 60 year or, or longer design life so um so being able to isolate the components that have a shorter design life uh you know replace or recycle those and retain the pieces that have a much longer design life is a, is a really really important thing and um and it's something for the whole industry to to get much better at yeah absolutely um there's another question here from alice uh, no that was from alistair sorry reading the other one from coxie um, saying, how do you think these thermal targets, um, insulators, isolators, material, thermal breaks, and so on, will work with the expected changes in the approved document B? I think you were writing about this kind of um, for our website not so long ago um, for a piece, because obviously um, there are changes coming up very soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, part B, part B is um, fire, and um, and so thermal targets, insulation materials. How are they going to work with part B? Yeah, the uh, well, clearly um, thermal breaks and uh, and minor components that are certainly part of window systems, um, bracketry, thermal, thermal breaks that are part of bracket systems are uh, exempt from the requirement for uh, limited combustibility. Um, sorry for international listeners. Um, part B, approved document B, is the uh, is the, the fire um, standard in in the UK or England, and is and was updated last year following um, Grenfell or in 2018 to uh, to ban um, combustible materials. Now there are various exemptions to that, and you know the thermal breaks within window frames, thermal breaks for brackets are are exempt from that. The, it's really insulation um, that is the that is important to be banned, and, and you know, rightly um, above 18 meters, um, you know, can have a pretty significant impact on on the fire performance of the building, and and is banned. I don't think that that there's a a conflict between fire performance and thermal performance. Um, it's something that can be dealt with. It's uh, you know we're, we're we're getting it now. We're getting the balance right now, um, and you know apart from some very detailed uh, issues around interfaces, I, I I think that I think it's got the balance right. Um, and you know if it's there are other problems with it, but I think it's not stopping us from from creating buildings that perform good, uh, yeah, perform well thermally. Oh, your mic's off. Plug here. There's a, there's a question um, which uh, you can answer, Damien, as well. But um, from Nikos asking about energy generating facades with the use of photovoltaics. Yeah. We have actually got a, um, a Climate Friday uh, piece coming out on that based on the research that's been coming out of our glass department, um, glass group. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday. <laughs> so, oh no, it came out last Friday, last Friday. Um, so if you want to go and read that, head over to the news section of our website, but um, I can hand over to Damien to answer his um, on the facade side of things. No, 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 I think that's, uh, it, it is, uh, and I didn't, uh, I didn't put it here, but we, that's something that we've been studying a lot as well, and there's another project that we're doing uh, at the moment with a um, shading system with photovoltaics integrated on the outside. And again, it's very sort of climate specific. Uh, this is in Mediterranean. And we found that uh, PVs on the facade could deliver uh, 
twenty percent of the um, of the demand for uh, for heating, cooling, for uh, all of the basically uh, the heating, ventilation, and and cooling. So all the things that I talked about related to the facade. PVs could could generate twenty um, percent of the energy to to satisfy that demand. So uh, and and that's on. Um, you know, PVs that are integrated in the facade aren't massively efficient. Um, we we see improvements in that all the time. Um, I think the cost isn't quite there a, a lot of the time for it to stack up, but uh, it's absolutely interesting and something that we're watching very closely and um, and and pushing for. So certainly potential. But it's got to be the right climate that we've been looking at both across your department and across the glass group as well kind of tying up together yeah. so um watch this space for more developments i think from uh, from us on that one but um there's, a, there's another question here from jean paul um how did you manage the thermal bridges on your case studies renovation in new york so in 63 madison how did you kind of manage the thermal bridges on that one uh well we the, there are um, there are areas where there's a kind of external net um, which is supporting the greenery and the um, uh, and some of the shading systems, um, and there and that penetrates the facade through to the to the primary structure at certain points. Um, but it was you know it was a it was a detail really. Um, it, it, the, all of the projections were, were wrapped. Um, there's very you know. We, we basically controlled it. Is is the answer? You know, you know, you have to know where it is. You um, you isolate those areas and you put thermal breaks in, and you account for it in the numbers. And you can't you can't eliminate every thermal bridge. Um, you you know where we've got projecting balconies on the facade. There there will always be an interface when you've got you know structure penetrating inside to outside. You just have to know about it. You've got to make it um, perform as as well as it can. And you've got to account for it in in the values, and if that means that you've got to make up with that bad performance by better performance somewhere else in the building, then you've got to do that. So, you know, my point isn't isn't that we have to eliminate all thermal bridges. We've got to count them, and we've got to do something about them. Yeah, and is are there, are there any new products? Um, we've got a question from um, Trolls um, asking about new products that are available for improving thermal bridging. Um, is that something which you're looking at? Is that something which can help? Uh, yeah, we are. Um, I, you know, to be honest, it, it, we are. Um, we're trying to, to instigate um, product development um, with with suppliers to do this, and we certainly have seen areas, um, all, in particular around masonry support. Um, you know, in in high rise residential, we're supporting. Uh, external masonry on you know floor by floor or maybe every second floor um, but every time you have one of those it's a pretty bad thermal bridge and um, and there's also the more we look at it there's there's a lot of embodied carbon in that because it's stainless steel which is embedded in the facade and there's quite a lot of it so um, so I think if we're looking to the future of something that is addressing both thermal bridging and embodied carbon, I think is try to get rid of steel um, as much as possible within the facades and look at, you know, if we're so obsessed with having brick clad buildings in this country, then um, I, sorry to say, but I, I think that, you know, we need to um, re reappraise that and look at maybe, you know, lightweight systems, um, you know, brick face GRC, even brick face precast, we found in, in some of our body carbon studies, outperforms uh, hand laid traditional brickwork because you because you're getting rid of so much of that steelwork. Different materials that you've got for the different facade systems. Just looking at one last question now, because I think we're kind of marching on for time. But um, has so Neil asks, has um, have EOC looked at timber curtain walling? And the effect on embodied, embodied carbon and other issues. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. The, uh, we we have a, a project which is um, 
well, we've got a few projects uh, using using timber coat modeling. Um, one in particular is a super interesting building, um, which you might see in our sustainable structures presentation in 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 a couple of weeks' time, um, where we've got a, a, a all timber um, frame uh, CLT uh, floor deck, timber coat model, and timber shading screen um, on the outside of it. So it's a it's a it's a you know, it's, we're really excited about it. It's just just starting on site um, very soon, um, and the there were issues with it. Um, timber curtain walling. I mean, that's a, this is a, a commercial office building that I'm talking about. Uh, there would absolutely be, you know, um, restrictions on on doing it in uh, in residential, particularly above 80 meters. You wouldn't be able to do a, a, a timber curtain wall. But um, but from an embodied carbon point of view. Um, maybe maybe we'll be able to present the numbers in a, in a future webinar, but it is very very good. Um, the fire is an issue um, and has to be. You need a fire engineered approach, and particularly in this case, we had this external shading screen um, where we've had to do a lot of research into uh, appropriate um, coatings and and protection and specification of the timber. To, to make sure that it is performing. Um, but but from an embodied perspective, yeah, the numbers are are, um, are very good. And in, in, in the round, I think the, it's practically a carbon neutral building. Brilliant. I think that's kind of, um, on that note, that's where we'll leave it. But I've um, I've just put popped a couple of links into the chat box down there to see. So Damien was talking, um, I've lost track of time now. It might, it might be a month ago. It might be a year ago. No, it's definitely it's definitely only maybe a month ago or so that uh, Damien was talking about uh, thermal bridging in one of our articles and also in the uh, circular economy of facades. So if you want to read those two articles there, they're kind of in the little chat box. Links to them are in the chat box there. If you miss that, then you can go and see it on the news um, section of our website. Incidentally, that's where you can sign up for the next ones that are coming up. Um, the next one that we have coming up is by Ben Lewis and Sam Gregson, who are our digital design specialists. Um, and they will be talking about digital design in the developing nature of the engineering process. So that'll be a really super talk next week. Um, and as again, you can watch all of them back. Um, and thank you again for persevering with our technical issues earlier. Um, we're super sorry about that. It was kind of beyond our control, unfortunately, but um, we're very grateful for you joining us. Um, Thank you very much indeed, Damien, and I uh, hope everybody enjoys their evenings. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. Okay. Bye.